for fortification to be effective, an industry needs to have the capacity to actually put the nutrients into that, into that food. So it's very difficult to do that if it is a very small industry. So for example, in some countries, dairy is produced by many, many small producers and then sold directly to the market. That would be a difficult situation in which to fortify milk because as, as it would be similarly with, with wheat, if wheat is being produced locally, milled locally by very small millers, and then um, consumed by the population directly from those small mills, it's very difficult to fortify simply because those small businesses, the small industry, um, the technology is, isn't um, very well developed, the quality control to work across the thousands of small mills or small, or small um, dairies uh, would be very difficult to manage. So one of the characteristics of successful food fortification is that it is a, it's a substantially or a sufficiently large industry um, business that is able to use the proper equipment, manage the proper control, quality control, quality assurance procedures so that there is an assurance of the product being consumed. So we sometimes call that the fortifiable version of that food vehicle. So whether milk is a good carrier for nutrients, for fortification, obviously, first of all, it depends on um, what the deficiencies are in that population, whether it is technologically feasible to add those nutrients to the milk, which milk is actually one of those vehicles that's relatively easy to fortify in that sense. But then it depends on the nature of the industry and where people are procuring that food. And, um, and the subset of the population who are deficient, do they get the milk from um, the industry that is sufficient size and consolidation to be able to effectively fortify that product? So across India, there are several dairies that are fortifying milk. Um, there's a long experience in Latin America of uh, fortifying milk in Mexico, in, in Chile, uh, where they've done so successfully and it is working in collaboration with the business um, and then assuring that the people who are deficient are consuming the product from the kind of industry that is capable of fortifying. Yeah, so several different elements to that question. Let's first start with the age element. So again, it depends on what children are consuming. Obviously, children, young children, particularly under five, consume a very small quantity of food. They have small stomachs, and so therefore the nutrients that are in their food, they must have a much um, richer density of nutrients for the amount of food that they consume. When you fortify a food for the general population, like milk, food that may, might be eaten by anybody, so milk or wheat, flour or maize flour or, or such products like that, you have to fortify at a level that won't become toxic to anyone, right? It, it, it meets the needs but won't become too high. So for those kinds of foods, the amount of nutrient that will be fortified will be set based on the consumption of adults. And usually we use an adult male because typically they would consume the largest quantity um, within a population. So um, for those staple foods, shall we call it, the nutrient contribution that the young children, the very young children will receive is obviously going to be smaller. Now that said, we've done some research across several countries that are fortifying, for example, um, oil with vitamin A. That's one of the interventions also here in India. Uh, several states are fortifying cooking oil with vitamin A. And we've found that just simply because there's a fairly substantial amount of cooking oil in the complementary foods that are consumed by infants and young children, um, they are receiving a, a, a substantial proportion of their daily requirements of vitamin A from that oil. So again, it, it is a, it's dependent on the, the vehicle that you're using, the food fortification vehicle, the pattern of consumption and utilization of that, um, whether they will meet the needs of young children. With wheat flour and so forth, just by the nature of how much you can put in those foods and how much young, can, young children are likely to eat, the contribution will be obviously much smaller. If you really want to focus on the youngest children, then fortifying what we call complementary foods or foods that have been specifically designed for that age group, then that's a better approach. They can be um, fortified with a level and with the, with the 
types of nutrients that are most likely to meet the needs of, of those younger children. With school-aged children and adolescents, the, they obviously consume a larger quantity of the food, um, and the evaluations that have been done have found um, significant impacts within school-aged children, adolescents, and adult populations, even, even for wheat flour, for example. Um, in terms of geography, uh, again, it depends on where people are procuring their food. So, for example, we did a, an assessment in, um, um, in Nigeria. Um, maize, everybody consumes maize in Nigeria. It's a staple food, at least in some of the states. It's a staple food. It's like rice for some other countries. The, um, but not everybody procures their maize in a similar way. So what we found in one state where we worked was that um, urban areas, people bought uh, maize from uh, maize flour from a producer, and that worked very well for, for fortification. But in the rural areas, they were more likely to either um, home produce maize and then grind that maize themselves or get their maize ground from a very small local uh, mill that served perhaps a small community or several households. Um, and that in that case, really fortification was going to reach the urban area and it wasn't going to reach the rural area. So you really have to know, you have to know what people eat, you have to know where they procure it from, and then what people eat who are the ones who are actually deficient. That's a good question. Certainly public-private engagement is critical for the solution. Fortification is a public-private engagement, right? The business is the one that will fortify. It's the government that should regulate and should, and should um, assess compliance. So that in itself is a public-private engagement, public-private partnership. In terms of the data, um, my perspective is that it is the responsibility of country government to know what the challenges are in their country that they should be building their policies around. So whether, um, whether private industry is in some way engaged um, and is able to, to make a contribution to that in some way, perhaps, but fundamentally governments need to know what the problem is, who's affected by those problems, and be able to make their policies based on the, on the realities of those, of those. Where I think industry could be much more done is in having a greater role in sharing data on composition of the foods that are on the market so much we talked about that a little bit during the session as well we talked about the the um, how much we know about or we will be this afternoon actually we haven't done that yet um, how much do we know about what's in foods and in some cases it's very difficult to really know the nutrient composition and I think there a public private engagement um, obviously there's proprietary information but there's also information that could be shared by industry that could really help us have a much better sense of what is the, the nutrient composition of the foods that people have access to um, and, uh, and, and again support that effort of the government to be able to match the requirements with the access and the opportunities that population has to meet those requirements. Yeah, that's a really good question and a difficult question to answer. So there have been some studies done with um, supplementation of either a single nutrient or, or several nutrients um, and looking at growth outcomes. And typically what we see is that it is a minor um, contribution. So maybe you get a little bit better growth, but you're not closing the gap of that growth. Um, and I think this is, this is the challenge that we have. We can't isolate the single, even though, even though micronutrient malnutrition and, and the quality of the diet generally contributes to impaired growth, only singling that out and not comprehensively addressing all of the multiple determinants isn't necessarily going to make a difference. If, if, the, if that, let's say zinc, let's say the, the child is zinc deficient, if you close that gap and you, and you take that child from deficient to sufficient, there may be another limiting factor within the, the many, many multiple factors that impede their growth that, that they still won't grow.